welcome everyone. Good morning. Please come in and come find a seat. Great to be gathered together as uh, God's gathered people. We're going to kick off by singing together. We're going to remind ourselves of the great grace that we have in our Lord Jesus. That we are saved through grace alone, through faith alone. Not because we deserved it, not because of anything we've done, but because of His great love for us. So let's all stand, let's all sing and celebrate that grace that we rest in. There we go. to the Colossians, he says this, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This was their story and this is our story. We are the church of the redeemed. Let's sing. We stand, the church of the redeemed, ransomed by the blood that sets us free. From the darkness, from 
to look forward to with you and you're with us now and we thank you for that. Amen. Yeah, yeah grab a seat. Welcome to church. Good morning, 8.30. Good to be together. My name is Jamie and a uh, special welcome and shout out to you if you're new or newish or visiting, uh, perhaps even here with family for some of the baptisms that are happening this morning. Uh, it's great to have you with us. Um, still some people coming through. Come on in. Find a seat. Um, welcome. Uh, if you are new, we would love to meet you, say good day, connect with you, and give you one of these. This is a welcome bag. Uh, in this bag, there's uh, a coffee voucher, food voucher, some info on church, uh, a Bible. Um, and you can get one of those from the barrels just in the foyer. So, um, feel free to swing by, say good day. We'd love to say hi and give you a bag, but also I know you're, you're welcome to kind of just be a fly on the wall as well, but we would love to connect with you. Um, same thing goes for those online. Um, if you're visiting uh, or checking us out, tuning in online today, uh, we can connect with you. Uh, if you want to let us know you're with us, you go to ev evchurch.info, um, hit the next steps button and um, you can connect with us that way. Great to have you with us online. Here at church, we love opening the Bible and hearing God speak to us. Um, I've been away, but I think we dipped back into Genesis last week. We're doing the same today. Uh, and next week, we'll start our new series, um, EV Grow slash Salvation. We'll hear a bit more about that later on. Um, but Graham will be up for us a little bit later. Um, we'll be looking at... Um, we'll be looking at what it means to be created in the image of God. So that should be a good, that should be good. Um, I'm going to pray 
Um, one of the things, one of the great privileges we have as Christians is to bring things to God in prayer. So I'm going to do that now. One of the many things on our minds um, is the referendum and also the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So we're going to pray for that this morning. So join me as I pray now. Our great and merciful Father, Father of all nations, peoples and tongues. Our nation's past is complex, Lord, and so are our hearts. We think with sadness of the wrongs in our history, especially those done against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Lord, please heal heal the scars and wounds uh, which continue to be felt by individuals, communities, and our nation. Give wisdom to the leaders in our communities, organisations and our governments. We pray for our own hearts that your Holy Spirit would convict us of our own sinful attitudes wherever they may lie. And Lord, we pray for the upcoming referendum. We pray that you would give wisdom and love to all voters and and that you would bring about whichever outcome you know to be best. And Lord, regardless of the outcome, we ask that we might enjoy peace, bring true, deep reconciliation, give all people greater understanding, compassion, generosity, forgiveness and peace, especially the love and peace that flows from a relationship with you. We pray for our Aboriginal brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you for the deep godliness of many Aboriginal Christians who are living for the Lord, often in tough circumstances. We pray that you would keep them faithful to your word and that you would fill them with your uh, spirit boldly to declare the praises of him who called them out of darkness into his marvellous light. We pray that you would open a door for their ministry so that more and more Aboriginal men and women can find freedom, fulfilment and life in Christ. We pray for those engaged in gospel work in Indigenous communities. Might they be a light to those communities, sharing the good news of Jesus. And that we too might be a light unto our community, sharing with those on the Central Coast the good news of Jesus. Amen. Welcome if you're coming in, find a seat. Um, We are going to do some baptisms now. So I'm going to welcome Ben to the stage and the families that have little... So oh. 
some pretty sweet baptism brushbacks going on there. That was cool. Some mohawks as well. It's awesome. Um, now is the time for those that are new with kids to head to the, the cafe um, where you can meet someone who can point you as to where to go for our awesome EV Kids program. The rest uh, who know where to go and what to do, now's the time you can do that. And for those that are sticking around in the room, we've got some time just to quickly turn and catch up with someone nearby. Good morning and hi to everyone watching at home on a screen. Uh, we know that there's lots of people checking us out on, online before joining us in person. Um, if that's you, welcome. Um, we have plenty of room here at EV and there's always a bunch of great programs for kids and youth and always a, a lot of great things happening. So we'd love to invite you to come and join us in person. Uh, if you're regularly connecting with us online, uh, we'd also love to invite you to connect on our Facebook group. Um, you can also check out the, uh, you can find that and check out that online. So evchurch.info. And if you're a regular who's usually with us but can't be with us today because of sickness or illness, we love you and we're praying for you. And uh, we look forward to meeting with you again soon. Um, great to have you with us this morning. If I could, if I could grab you back, if I could grab you back, that'd be awesome. Lots of good conversations happening, plenty of time to catch up on or pick those back up a little bit later on. Um, no family news this morning. I thought I might add my own family news. Um, if you haven't, first week of October, if you haven't scalped your lawn, please make sure you do that. Your lawn will love you. You could even do a bit of top dress. Uh, so, yeah, they, this my two cents there. Great time to do that. I um, want to let you know of a few things coming up. Uh, first, I want to talk about startups. So startups kicking off uh, in two weeks. So this is three Sundays. You've got the dates down there. So 22nd of October, um, 3 o'clock, I think, yeah, in the hall up, up top. So three Sundays, and Startup is really great for you if you're new or newish to church, but uh, you want to do a few things, and, and those things might include uh, connect into church life, um, connect and meet with some of the pastors and others that might be new to church. Um, if you really want to, um, I think it's most helpful to kind of check out what we're on about as a church, so I want to encourage you to get along to Startup if that's you. Also, super helpful for landing in a growth group, so if that's you, Get along to start up. So it's a really great series. So um, you can sign up on the website um, or chat to someone at the barrels. Explaining Christianity is a series that uh, does exactly what it sounds. It, um, it ex explains what being a Christian is all about. So this is a really great series, perfect to bring someone who uh, doesn't know Jesus or maybe you've just got a bunch of questions. So I'd love to invite you along to us explaining Christianity. Five Tuesday nights, um, you can, more info online, got the dates up there, same thing, you can chat to someone at the barrels as well if that's something that you're interested in. Our God's been incredibly generous and good to us, so in response to his goodness to us, we want to be generous people and want to encourage you to, as you're able, continue to give to see the gospel go out here on the coast. You can do that online or with the boxes just in the alleys there, uh, the hall, as you walk out to the, the round. Um, we're going to read the Bible. So I'm going to invite Jackie up. So Jackie, come on up. Um, before we do, you might be sitting on one of these. This is for you. Take it home. This is our new series that will kick off next week. Um, so you can also sign up online to get them shot to you if you'd prefer that as well. Uh, after we read two readings that will be on the screen, um, Graham will jump up. Thanks, Jackie. Thanks, Jackie. 
Our first reading today is from Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to chapter 2, verse 3. Genesis chapter 1, 26 to chapter 2, verse 3. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and he said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground... Everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work that he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Our second reading today is from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 to 18. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold... We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But when anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Morning, everyone. Great to be here. Um, as Jamie said, uh, next week we get into EV Grow and you'll notice you have one of these on each of your seats. It'd be great if you could take that home and actually um, start getting into it this week, start using it. It'll be fantastic to help us um, together uh, get into this series. Um, today we're doing uh, dipping back into uh, Genesis and uh, thinking a bit more about what it means to be created in the image of God. So this is a critical topic. Uh, let's pray as we get into that together. Our Father, we recognise how foundational this topic is, and so we ask, please, this morning, help for me to speak clearly and truthfully about what it is to be a human, and please, Lord, help us uh, to grasp the massive implications that this has for us and for our world. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, each year at Summerfest, uh, in the afternoons, a bunch of us go door knocking around the coast. And so one summer, uh, I was door knocking, came to a house in Terrigal, and there was a grandmother there, and she was looking after her granddaughter. And she was in the kitchen, the kitchen was just by the front door, and she was chopping up chicken, so she came to the front door with a knife. And uh, <laughs> she, she was great. She was keen for a chat, she was pretty feisty, uh, she was happy to strongly disagree, but it was a, a warm discussion. And she wanted to share how she didn't believe in God, there was no God, and uh, that all humans were um, just animals like any other animal, and uh, all life is as important as all other life. So the jelly blubber that floats around in the ocean is just as important as the person standing at her front door. We're all just animals. And all the while she's unaware that she's waving the knife around passionately. And we're having this good back and forth discussion, and I almost said to her, I didn't say this, but I almost said to her, If you believe that there is no difference between an animal and a human, why is it that you're chopping up the chicken and looking after your granddaughter? 
why aren't you chopping up your granddaughter and looking after the chicken? The chicken will give you some eggs and there's a lot more meat on your granddaughter. Now, <laughs> you can see why I didn't say that. <laughs> But if I had, you could see what I would have been trying to do, to get under her skin to show that as humans, we cannot operate like human beings are only as important as every other, every other animal. But on what basis can we say that human beings are special? What is it to be a human? Well, the answer comes in understanding what it means to be created in the image of God. We talked about it briefly as we went through Genesis, but we're looping back today to this critical topic. And the way we're going to do it is by thinking about the four eras of the image of God and understanding some of the implications that flow from each era. Now, I want to warn you, I'm going to spend 80% of my time on the first era. So if 80% of my time is gone and I'm only on point one, don't panic. So let's start by looking at era one, the original image. When it comes to understanding what it means that humans are created in the image of God, how do you work it out? Let me begin by sharing what I think are two wrong ways to work out what it means to be created in the image of God. The first is to start with us humans and look at what we're like and work back to God. And so draw conclusions about God from humanity to think we, we're created in the image of God and so God must be like us, just bigger, better, huger and even with a human body like us. And I think, I know this approach and thinking is wrong. God is wholly other than us. God is transcendent, unique, beyond, above us. God is free, all-knowing, all-powerful, all places. And he definitely doesn't have a human body. In Colossians 1, Jesus is called the image of the invisible God. Now, he's not just invisible because he hasn't shown himself to us. He's not just invisible because if we saw his glory, we would die. He's invisible because John 4, God is spirit, not physical, has no body. He's the eternal spirit. Now, people might push back if they know a bit of the Bible and say, isn't there a bunch of times where God appears as a human being in the Bible? Well, no, actually. There are a number of times where angels appear, sometimes looking like humans, where angels appear and speak so directly from God that it can say, the Lord said... But it's the angel speaking, the person speaking. The angel is not God, but they so represent God that when the angel speaks, it can say, God said. So sometimes it says, God said. Sometimes it says, the angel said. And we know that these are not God come in a body because in John 1, John 4, it says, no one has ever seen God. 1 Timothy 6, it says, God lives in unapproachable light whom no one has seen or can see. These angels who spoke from God are not God come with a body. No, God is invisible. God is spirit. It's not until the Lord Jesus comes, God the Son, the invisible spirit, becomes human while remaining fully God. We see God takes on a human body by becoming fully human. God is utterly above us and beyond us and has no body for he is spirit. And so if we try to work out what it is to be created in the image of God, we make a mistake if we work from us back to God. What we do is we start to create God in our image. What we do is we start to domesticate God. I think that's the first way that people wrongly approach, what it mean, wrongly approach trying to work out what it means to be created in the image of God. They look at us humans and work back to God. The second way I think people wrongly approach what it means to work out what it means to be created in the image of God is to look at the animals and look at us and see how we're different from the animals and conclude that's what it means to be created in the image of God. Now, there is something in it, but it misses the heart. So people will observe things like animals don't speak, at least not complex communication like we do. So complex communication, that must be what it means to be created in the image of God. Or... Animals don't have high-level reasoning, high-level intelligence. You know, some smart animals can work out that, uh, like the, the otter, if you get a rock, you can actually crack a shellfish open and eat it. That's quite clever. But animals don't develop technologies that create greater technologies. Human intelligence is far above animal intelligence. And so, high-level intelligence and reasoning, that must be what it means to be created in the image of God. Animals don't have capacity for morality the way that humans do. Animals live by instinct, but humans have conscience and a sense of objective right and objective wrong and act accordingly or not accordingly. So capacity for morality, that must be what it means to be created in the image of God. But is this sort of thinking right? 
Well, we see that there's something in this. As you move through the opening pages of Genesis and, in fact, through the rest of the Bible, we see that God has created humans unique with the capacity to communicate, with the capacity for reasoning and intelligence, with the capacity for morality, with the capacity for moral decision-making, with a conscience, with a soul, an embodied soul. But is this all that it means to be created in the image of God? Well, I think it's part of what it is to be created in the image of God, but not the whole picture. In fact... Not the heart of what it means to be created in the image of God. Part, but not heart. These things, intelligence, reason, morality, conscience, communication, awareness of the divine, having a soul, are capacities that God has given humans made in his image that enable us to express what it most fundamentally means to be created in the image of God. So, how do we work out what it means to be created in the image of God? We don't start with humans and work back to God. We don't start with the animals and work towards humans. We start with God and what he's revealed to us. Two key places. The first, we look at what he's revealed about the image of God at creation. Genesis 1. So open there if you're not already there. And two, we look at what God's ultimately revealed about the image of God in his son. We move from God to us. So, what is the heart of what it means to be created in the image of God? Come with me, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. We come to the high point of God's creation, mankind created in God's own image. Right up until now, in the Genesis creation account, God has created all the animals according to their kinds. But here in verse 26, God says, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, distinct from the animals. Animals created according to their kinds. Humanity created in the image of God. And the word image and likeness are almost synonymous, but they have nuances to them. The Hebrew word for image means to carve or to cut and can be used to describe the carving of the likeness of an animal or a person. Man is the carving of God, the very representation of God. And the Hebrew word likeness just comes from the root to be like. And so a human is an image of God, an exact rep- an, a representation of God that is like God. And so... We see that God has created us to be in his image, to display him to the world, his glory to the world. Everything in creation displays something of the glory of God, but humans, in a unique way, display who God is. Because humans are the very image of God, the carving of God, representing him and like him. It's supposed to be that when you look at a human, you see a little picture of God. Ah, that's what God is like. Not in all fullness but a clear picture of who God is walking on this planet, a little mirror reflecting God to the universe. In man, God has become visible on earth. And in what way is man like God? Well, back to verse 26. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. And who is the us there at the creation of the universe? A few suggestions have been um, given But I'm convinced the only one that makes sense is the us is God. Right at the beginning of the Bible, we see that the one and only God is not a simple unity, but a complex unity. It's not until we come to the New Testament that it's actually revealed that God is a tri-unity, a trinity. One God in three persons, Father, Son, Spirit. God always existing in perfect relationship with himself. Perfect relationship of love between Father, Son, Spirit, the one triune God. And so if God says, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, it indicates that God is making us like him for loving relationship too. Loving relationship with him and loving relationship with each other. And as Genesis unfolds and the rest of the Bible, we see that is exactly what we are made for. Loving relationship with God, a relationship of loving obedience and a relationship of loving service towards our fellow man. And the very fact that God creates humanity, male and female, verse 27, a complex unity, two genders making up one humanity, 
shows life is about loving relationships. Humanity is made up of male and female, designed for complementary relationship with each other, ultimately expressed in marriage. Just as God is a complex unity, he creates humanity as a complex unity. Just as God is the God of loving relationships, he creates us in his image to be people of loving relationships. It's the very core of who he is. And so when he creates us in his image, it's who he creates us to be. A fundamental part of what it is to be made in the image of God is to display to the world the glory of God's loving goodness by rightly relating to him in loving obedience and rightly relating to each other in loving service. But there's more to image bearing. Verse 26 again. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image and our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, of the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. The Lord God is the absolute ruler over all things, and so when he creates us... He creates us to be rulers, ruling under him, ruling like him. God is a loving ruler and we are to be loving rulers, not destroying and pillaging the earth, but taking responsibility for it, to cultivate it, to subdue it, to work it, to look after it, to build it, to turn it into a beautiful garden. And a key part of what it is to be made in the image of God is this, to display to the world the glory of God's loving goodness by relating rightly to creation loving rule over creation and then verse 28 you see that god says be fruitful increase in number fill the earth and subdue it god's plan for humanity is to multiply for man and woman to marry chapter 2 and in the context of this exclusive sexual union to bear and raise children new image bearers new likenesses of god So the image of God multiplies and multiplies and multiplies and is everywhere across the face of the earth displaying the glory of God's loving goodness in everyone to the universe. Because every human is a picture of the loving goodness of God. And we see this even more clearly when the perfect image bearer arrives. Jesus, the perfect image of God come amongst us. God himself, God the Son, born as a sinless man, the perfect image of the invisible God, Colossians 1. The radiance of his glory and exact representation of his being, Hebrews 1. What do you see Jesus doing as God's perfect image bearer? We see him displaying the glory of God's loving goodness perfectly. We see it in his relationship with his heavenly father, perfect loving obedience, even to the point of death on the cross for him. We see it in his relationship to humanity, loving service even to the point of death on the cross for us and we see it in his relationship to creation loving rule even to the point of death on the cross to renew creation to work out what it means to bear the image of god we don't look at us humans back to god we don't look at the animals back to us we look at christ down to us we see in christ the perfect image bearer displaying the glory of god's loving goodness towards his father loving obedience towards humans loving service, towards creation loving rule. That's what we were created to be as image bearers. Mirroring the glory of God's loving goodness to the universe, we were created to be towards God, living in loving obedience, towards our fellow man, loving service, and towards creation, loving rule. It was meant to be that you could look at a human and say, I see God reflected in that human. Loving goodness. Another way of saying it is holiness, righteousness, the glory of God's loving goodness shining forth in humans. Now, all this gets ruined, but we'll come back to that in a moment. Firstly, I want to look at three massive implications of this. The first one is the uniqueness of humanity. Last term in youth, they were doing Genesis just like uh, we were doing Genesis. And on this, the week, they were looking at this passage, Genesis 1, and talking about what it means to be created in the image of God. The preacher helpfully used a, an illustration uh, to show the uniqueness of humans above all other animals. And the example, the illustration went something like this. Now, I wasn't there, so I don't know exactly how it went. But it went something like this. Imagine you come across a burning building. Trapped inside the burning building are a dog and a human baby. Opposite ends of the building, you can't save both, and so you save the human baby, right? And then he went to go on. But 
what happened was suddenly there was a flurry of conversation. There were people annoyed. There were people upset. There were people confused. There were people concerned. There were kids saying things like, not if it was my dog. If it was my dog, I'd save the dog, not someone else's baby. Now, a lot of this thinking is becoming part of our society. Now, if you're an atheist and you believe the world has come about through random chance and that there's no God and that the thought that we've been created in the image of God is just stupid, this is logical. Two animals in a building, uh, you can only save one, 50-50 which animal you pick. If one animal is your pet and the other is someone else's child, well, feel free to pick the one that you're more attached to or the one you find cuter or the one you think will bring you greater benefit or the one you think will bring society greater benefit. But if you see humans as being created in the image of God, you see the humans as absolutely unique and set apart above the rest of the created order. Not just highly evolved animals. We are the very stamp of God. Humans are the images of God upon this planet shining forth His glory. And as such, are to lovingly rule the rest of creation. Cultivating, not destroying, but ruling over it. Harvesting plant and animal life. If there was one human and all of our pets in a birding building, and you can save the one human baby or the hundred pets, you choose the one human every time. Two, the sanctity of human life. Human life is absolutely sacred. In Genesis 9, 6, it says, Whoever sheds human blood, by humans shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God, God has made mankind. Why is there to be justice, punishment, extreme punishment for the taking of a human life as opposed to an animal life? Because we're made in the very image of God. And to do violence to a human is to do violence to the representative, the representation of God. To kill a human is to, in some sense, try to kill God if that were possible. Human life is absolutely sacrosanct. You see some of this logic in James 3. Paraphrase James 3 says, how, how can someone pray God in one moment and then with the same mouth curse someone made in the image of God? Because that's indirectly to curse God. This indicates that what you do to a human made in God's image, in some sense, you do to God. Imagine this. You go over to someone's house um, for, for a dinner um, and you're all having dinner together, enjoying time, and then you need to go to the toilet. And you do that thing where you're, you're walking down the hall you're not, not sure which door is, is the toilet door. And, so, and you open one and you go in thinking it's the, it's the bathroom, but it's not, it's a bedroom. But the thing that grabs your attention is on the wall there's a dartboard. And on the dartboard there's a printed out picture of you, <laughs> an image of you. And the eyes have been scratched out. And there's darts, 20 darts stuck all over the face. And there's a big bowie knife sunk right into the top of the skull. And you think, run, run. <laughs> if someone could do that to your image, to the representation of you, it likely means if, if that person had the opportunity arose, they might do it to you. And that's exactly what we did when God came to us. In an even more profound way, what you do to God's image, your fellow human beings, is how you treat God. Is directed against God. This has huge things to say to our culture. Think with me abortion. And I'm sorry if this is a painful topic for you. Now that all your sins, if you come to trust in Jesus, all of our sins are forgiven by Jesus. But on this issue of abortion, there's crystal clarity. To take any human life is to kill God's image bearer and is condemned by God. And according to the Bible, human life is life from conception. From the moment the sperm fertilizes the egg. Human life is sacred, including the life of the unborn baby. No human, whoever they may be, ever has the right to take the life of another human, even the life inside us, even if the baby has genetic abnormalities, for example, Down syndrome. Do you know that because of our um, advanced technology so that we could do prenatal testing, I believe the statistic is approximately 90% of kids with Down syndrome are aborted. That's a horror. The truth also, this truth also speaks against contraception that kills the fertilised egg and forms the IVF that discard fertilised eggs that aren't used. Now, a lot more could be said here, and we have a hot topic, so you could jump on the web and look at that. Now, again, I want to try to say these things clearly but gently. If you have had an abortion, this is the place for you because this is a place filled with sinners. We come to Jesus to be cleansed and our guilt to be removed once and for all. 
Euthanasia. What happens to a society once euthanasia is legalised and legal restraint is removed? A subtle, unspoken shift takes place. A subtle pressure placed upon the infirm and elderly and sick to remove themselves if they feel that they're causing difficulty to others or if they feel that they have lost meaning in life. Once you lose any sense that human life is sacred and not to be taken even by us because we're created in the image of God, restraint is removed. And the other side of the equation is the subtle impact upon the adult children of sick and elderly parents. The euthanising of your parents now becomes a subtle unspoken possibility because for many of us, parents can become a a massive impact on your life, a, a real burden. And if they die you're looking at a significant positive uplift in your personal finances. And so the the subtle possibility uh, open for sinners is maybe it would be better if we helped them understand that to come to the end more quickly would be good for them. You know, their life doesn't have heaps of happiness in them and they are pretty unwell and frail. And Now, you might be shocked that I could even suggest that an adult child would subtly influence their elderly parents in order to end their life prematurely because it would benefit that adult child, then can I encourage you to develop a a healthy mistrust of yourself. (laughs) Sin lives in the heart of every one of us and it's deceptive. None of us is beyond this sort of temptation. Once a society legalises euthanasia, you create a subtle shift that opens the floodgates of death for our ill, for our elderly, for our lonely, and the vulnerable are the ones who should be honoured and looked after and cared for. We see this in Canada, where euthanasia was legalised in 2016. In 2020, 2.5% of all deaths in Canada were by medically assisted suicide. 2.5% of all deaths. This represents a growth of 34% on the year before. 34% of growth in one year. That is huge. Now, it, it may taper off, it may halve, but even so, if that sort of growth rate continues over the next five years, imagine where we'll be. And soon they're brought in the legislation to those uh, with mental health issues. Now, you can see where this is heading, can't you? Let me give you one more. Extreme environmentalism. It seems to me that there's a bunch of environmental work that is healthy and trying to do really good things, but there's a growing strand of environmentalism that sees uh, the environment as good and human beings as evil. And so the evil needs to be purged for the good to survive. This is not environmentalism that's based on being created in the image of God and we have a duty and a role to look after and care for the created order and to uh, harvest it in order that human society may flourish. No, this form of environmentalism is about getting the environment to win even if large swathes of humanity die out. And in fact, some are proposing policies that will mean large chunks of humanity do die out. And those who die out will particularly be the poor and vulnerable. You can only think this way if you live in a society that's deleted the truth that we are created in the image of God. Third big implication, true human equality. See, when you talk about being equal, you have to define what you mean by equal. Uh, In what way are humans equal? Think about the equal sign in maths. This equals this. These two things are exactly the same. In what way are humans equal? Well, we're not equally good at everything, are we? That's why we have average and above average and below average. And that's why you go in a competition, you don't always win. Uh, That's why people get different marks on assignments. And and in fact, we're not even born genetically equal. Some people are just born way, way smarter. Some people are born with way better EQ. Some people are born with greater physicality than others. But the fact that human beings are created in the image of God says... We are equally image bearers, regardless of our abilities or disabilities, regardless of how productive or unproductive, regardless of whether we win or lose, regardless of whether we earn a squillion dollars or a pittance, you are image bearers of God, the stamp of God is upon you, and so we are all of incredible worth and value. No human more valuable or of more worth than another. Just by being human, we are equal in value. Just by being made in the likeness, in the very image of God, we're equal in worth. Men and women, not equal in many ways. In fact, genetically different in every cell of our body. I cannot bear a child no matter how much I want to. Men and women are not equal in the sense that we're exactly the same. And boy, that's wonderfully good. We're not the same. 
And so the roles that God has given men and women are not exactly the same. But in the sense that we are image bearers, we are absolutely equal of absolute equality in worth and dignity and value. Not by virtue of the job we hold. Not by virtue of how much money we earn. Not by virtue of who's stronger or who's smarter. But by virtue of the fact that every human being is created in the very image of God. We can be different but utterly equal. Racism has no place amongst Christians because we all bear the image of God. People of every tribe and colour and nation and race, utterly equal in worth and dignity. Now, there will be things in every culture that need critiquing by God's word. Western culture, Eastern culture, Indigenous culture, Pacific culture. It's not racism to critique things in culture. Every culture has been flawed by sinful human beings, some far more than others. But every human is of equal value and worth. Now, you remove God from the picture. You delete image bearing out of our view of the world and what are you left with? If we were honest as a society and truly embraced, it would mean if, we, if there were no God and humans were not created in the image of God, then there is no basis for equality. The fundamental equality of all humans comes from a Christian view of the world. And while the movers and shakers in our society want to get rid of Christian thinking, the very desire for equality is rooted in Christian thinking. It comes from God. Get rid of God and get rid of Christian thought and what you're left with is humans are just very smart and capable animals who through the evolutionary process of the survival of the fittest have risen to the top of the food chain. And so if this atheistic view of the world is correct, human life is not about worth and dignity and equality. It's about me beating you so I can be fittest. We're just animals and the smartest and the most brutal win. So good luck to you because I will tear you apart. In contrast, the Bible paints a beautiful picture of equality and worth and dignity as image bearers without the stupidity of pretending we all have to be the same in everything. That's era one, the original image. Era two, the defaced image. In Genesis 2, humanity rebels against God and the result is that the image of God is defaced. Not destroyed, you see in Genesis 6, Genesis 9, humans are still referred as being in the image of God after the fall. But the image is massively polluted, perverted, corrupted, shattered, but not obliterated. I remember when I was a kid, we used to have this thing called a Kamado pot, which is like a huge ceramic Weber, set about this high, coals in the bottom, cook the chook on the top, you could open it up. Um, And I was swinging on it, it was off, I was swinging on it, and it tipped over, shattered, shattered into 50 pieces. I knew I was going to get in trouble, and I did. I got in a lot of trouble. But later on, my my dad fixed it. He painstakingly used this ceramic cement to jigsaw, put the jigsaw back together. And for the next 20 years, it sat there um, ugly (laughs) in in our house, Um, all sort of patched together. And every time you cooked something in it, it it, it tasted like chemicals. Um, But (laughs) it was still there and in some sense functioned. Now, that's us, the images of God. Because of the fall, our image bearing has, is a shattered version of what it was, still held together but, and bearing some similarity to what it was, but marred and scarred. And Romans 3 says, We have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are meant to image, to mirror the glory of God's loving goodness to the universe, but we've miserably failed. And so we live towards God in rebellious disobedience and each other, in sinful selfishness and towards creation, either or often both in harsh mistreatment and worship of creation instead of God. Still image bearers and so still unique from the animals and human life is sacred and we're equal in value, but we are not what we're meant to be. One implication of this is sin dehumanises us. To live the most truly human life is to live the image bearing life, the life of goodness and holiness and righteousness and love. And so our fall into sin dehumanises us. And every time we sin, we're doing something subhuman, something so perverse and at odds with what it is to be made in the image of God. We're being like an animal, like a brute beast. Can I encourage you to let this be one more thing that deters you from sinning? Era three, the renewed image. God in his love came on a rescue mission to save us and to renew the image of God in us. 
God sent his son. God the son came and became truly human and image bearer. In fact, the perfect image bearer of God. And as such, died under the judgment of God that we deserve for our defacement of the image of God, defacement of the glory of God. And because of his death, we can not only be cleansed, forgiven, be right with God, have our judgment taken, be children of God, but also be increasingly transformed back into the image of God. Come with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. That was this Jackie read for us before. Two Corinthians three eighteen, and we all talking to Christians, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into His image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. As we look on the Lord's glory displayed perfectly in Jesus, the perfect image of God. We Christians are being increasingly transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. The Christian who's come to Jesus for salvation is now, day by day, being transformed back into the image of God as perfectly seen in Jesus. He's having God's glory renewed in them. And all this happens by the Spirit who is slowly renewing the image of God in us so that we increasingly display the glory of God's loving goodness towards God Growing loving obedience. Towards each other, growing loving service. Towards creation, growing loving rule. That's what's happening to you right now if you're a Christian. The implication of this, the gospel rehumanizes people to display God's glory. As we share the good news about Jesus, people become Christians, come to salvation. But that's the beginning of our ministry together with each other. We're now working to increasingly see ourselves, each other, transformed into the fullness of Christ renewed back into the image of God with increasing glory, becoming more and more truly human, truly image-bearing. And this also that God might receive the glory he deserves as more and more people on the earth increasingly bear his image more and more fully. Final era, era four, the perfected image. When Christ comes again, we will be totally transformed into the perfected image of God made fully like Christ, and we will be like him forever. Perfect image bearers. Made perfect as those who live in perfect loving obedience to God. Perfect loving service towards each other. Perfect loving rule over a new and perfected creation. A multitude of little perfect images of God living forever in a perfect creation. Shining forth the glory of the Lord's loving goodness for the universe to see forever and ever and ever and we will never fall again. The final implication is that we have real eternal hope. What we are destined for is something incredible, something amazing because the image of God will not just be restored in us but be perfected in us in such a way that we will never fall again. God's plan was always, not just that we would get back to the beginning, but that we would get back to somewhere better. To, through his Son, form us into the perfect image of God. The image of God that will never again be defaced. Eternal hope. I don't know, have you ever been up a tree, chainsawing and chainsawing, trying to cut this huge branch, trying to cut it down, trying to cut it down, only to work out that you're standing on the branch that you're cutting off? <laughs> no, neither have I. But that's what Western society has been doing for decades. Trying to cut out of society all Christian thought and influence. But little do they realise that anything good about our Western culture has come from the Bible. And one of those very key pieces is the God-given truth that all human beings are image bearers of God. And so our society shouldn't be surprised as people increasingly act like animals towards each other. Because that's exactly what they keep telling us we are, animals. But we have something far, far more wonderful to share with our world. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we ask that you would please help us to see the world your way. To understand what it means to be bearers of the image of God. That the uniqueness of humans above the animals, the sanctity of human life, the fundamental equality and worth of all people, 
that the truly human life is the life of holiness, that the gospel rehumanizes people and displays your glory. Oh, please, Lord, conform us to the image of your Son, that the glory of your image might be displayed more and more fully in us. And we look forward to the day, Lord, when your Son returns and when your image will be perfected in us. Come, Lord Jesus. We ask it in his name. Amen. Uh, great to hear about that real eternal hope that we have in the perfect image bearer, our Lord Jesus, as we reflect on this, as he's day by day transforming us and renewing us. Let's stand and let's, uh, let's sing praises to him. that brought us back to the fold of God. All through our Lord Jesus, our perfect image bearer. Let's keep singing together.
brought me to the fall of love. said come Lord Jesus um, we've got a bit of time in fact we've got 10 minutes so those with uh, kids you can take a bit of time I might even recommend holding your wife's hand as you walk the 50 meters might feel like a date um, enjoy the time or just take your time um, catching up connecting with those around um, enjoy the day grab one of these take it with you and we'll looking forward to seeing you next week for our new series <laughs>